Welcome to the Keogh School Master of Global Affairs program info session. My name is Iris Ma. Um, I'm the Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs in the Keogh School, and I work very closely with all my colleagues in the Dean's Office, including to manage um, the Masters of Global Affairs program. Welcome to our info session again. Great, I saw a heart and I saw um, a thumbs up. Great, okay, thank you guys. I feel very encouraged. Okay, um, I will keep going. So let me share my screen with you. Oh, um, can you can you hear me? We can hear you, Iris. You can keep oh, going. okay. Okay, thank you. Can you see my slides? We see them. Wonderful. Thank you. So I want you to begin with just a few words about the Keogh School. MGA program is part of the Keogh School. So you probably will wonder, you know, what is Keogh School and um, what is the special part about the school? Look at this building on the right hand side of my screen. That is the brand new building we have. Um, that is where the Keogh School is located. Um, the building was uh, finished about five years ago and the school was founded about only eight years ago. I know that we are very young, but we are so energetic and uh, full of you know, uh, excitement to welcome students to our program. Keogh School is the first new school established on campus of Notre Dame in nearly a century. And, uh, but you know, within the, just the past few years, we've recruited more than five, uh, 50 full-time regular faculties. And you can imagine all these faculty members come from all kinds of disciplinary backgrounds. And all, I would say, uh, geographically speaking, they also come from all over the world, really a very diverse um, faculty. So we have trained political scientists, economists, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, peace builder. We also have scholars who have double identity on one hand, they are professors teaching in the classroom, but on the other hand, they are also policymakers engaged in DC or in, uh, United, uh, in United Nations or in European unions and or they are uh, long time pra uh, practitioners on the ground working with local communities building different kinds of projects and initiatives. So this is the great place for you to come and uh, to connect the study of global affairs with policy and practice. So I want you to very quickly touch on these four points about the Keogh School. From what I just said about you know, the school, but also about the faculty, you probably get the sense that um, we are very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. That is our approach to lots of global challenges, issues, and problems, you know, problem solving and issue driven approach. But most importantly, I would say the, the feature or the point I wanted to draw the distinction between Keogh School and many other peer programs is that we are very much human oriented, human centered approach. In the Keogh School, we emphasize human dignity. Imagine in the future, you know, after two years with us, you become a global leader, you come become a change maker. We would like you to be also an ethical thinker. We would like you to understand any possible potential impact of your policy, of your practice upon local communities and especially populations that are vulnerable, that need more help and support. So this is the lens through which we teach we research and we practice. And uh, uh, we would like to bridge all these. So ultimately the goal, especially in the master's program is to help you develop your professional goals and advance your career by polishing skills, by increasing your competency. 
And like many other peer uh, programs, institutions, Keogh School does not have departments. As I mentioned, we have all kinds of scholars, but also we have all kinds of um, institutes and centers. And this is a very diverse home for students to come. You can see that on the screen, I have we have nine different institutes and centers in the Keogh School. Um, ranging, you know, from, I would say, in terms of the size, in terms of the history, in terms of the capacity, they also vary uh, significantly. So this is a very diverse and yet very enriching, exciting landscape. So looking at the list, we have Ansari Institute dedicated to the understanding of global engagement with religion. And we have Cloud Cent uh, Center, now is an institute already, Cloud Institute for Civil and Human Rights, if you're interested in the topic of civil human rights, that is the place you want to have affiliation with. And we have McKenna Center for Human Development and Global Business. We have faculty members based in McKenna Center, for example, who develop eight different programs in the country, but also around the world, using knowledge and um, consultancy to help local uh, people, especially people who live in poverty, to become effective entrepreneurs to lift themselves out of poverty, but also to contribute to their own communities. And we have Kellogg Institute for International Studies, um, long-standing tradition with a regional focus in Latin America, Africa, and also part of Asia. We have Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. I think if you are interested in peace studies, you must have heard about Kroc Institute here. And we also have Nav Navik Institute for European Studies. Um, and uh, you, Nana the Institute lately has organized many flash panels, but also events related to the war in Ukraine. And we have uh, Keo Norton for Irish studies. You probably know that Notre Dame is a school of fighting Irish. So of course we need to have a place for Irish studies. And we also have Liu Institute for Asia and Asian studies. We have Poti Institute for global development. You can see that these nine institutes and centers, some of them are basically a uh, theme or topic driven, and some of them are regional focused. Uh, they also work with each other, have cross institute center collaboration that students can be part of. Of course, you're very interested in, you know, the student population here, especially in the master's program. Looking at the picture, I think it is self-evident that we have a very diverse community, not just about the faculty members I mentioned, but also about students. So our students come from all over the world. Some of them, of course, are domestic students in the US, but many of them also come from this long list of countries on the screen you can see. And um, they, um, I would say, the vast majority of students came to our program with a really rich professional uh, professional ex experience already. Some of them have worked on the ground with local communities on local issues probably for a decade. Some of them with several years of professional experience. And um, every year, we every cohort, we admitted, I would say, um, about 55%, sometimes up to 65% are international students. Every year, students told me and my colleagues that, um, you know, one of the most important uh, things that really draw them to the master's program in the Keogh School is the diverse student population, because you're not just learning from your professors, your, you know, um, staff members in the classroom setting or during advising meetings you are also learning from your classmates who might have firsthand experience in Afghanistan, who might be, who might have been there, you know, helping with um, educational issues or policies in South Africa, or who might have been in the State Department or a U.S. government who works on different uh, issues and understanding the institutional organizations. So all these basically make it a very diverse, enriching, uh, enriching communities for our student to, to be part of. Just zoom in a little bit about the master's program. I believe lots of students, especially when you're applying, you're very interested in the curriculum. So, you know, I was an international student, was also a graduate student for many years. I also applied to many different graduate programs in different countries. So I really understand that, you know, the core of um, the 
attraction, I would say probably is the courses, is the faculty, is the skills and competencies, knowledge you will be able to acquire and obtain during your uh, studies with us. So you probably have learned that we have three different concentrations. They are sustainable development, international peace studies, and governance and policy. Just by looking at the titles of these three concentrations, you probably can see that, you know, there are some commonalities across the board. As I just mentioned in the very first slide, human-centered, human-oriented approach to problem solving, to issue-driven approach, um, but also some really distinct features about each concentration, especially related to your own career pursuit, your own professional goals, your own academic interest. So for example, sustainable development, here you are gonna lay the solid groundwork in uh, qualitative, but also quantitative methods. You will take courses like, you know, um, micro applied microecom, but also um, policy evaluation, advanced econometrics, but also you're gonna study issues such as environmental policy or uh, water crisis in different places, or you will talk, you will learn from professors about small scale agriculture, or you'll probably look at uh, issues like food uh, production or food security. And of course, you know, uh, forestation and all those. And um, if we talk about international peace studies, you probably immediately think about peace building, different approaches to peace building, understanding all levels of organizations, um, actors and institutions, how they work, and also skills such as mediation, such as uh, you know, uh, strategic peace building, holistic approach, and also this very strong sense of uh, accompaniment, local accompaniment to really understand local culture, you know, tradition in order to, to make um, effective policy recommendations. And um, policy, governance and policy, just by look, looking at this title, you probably get a sense that um, this concentration is um, leaning towards you know, the topics about international organizations and research methods for policy making, but also understand, uh, but also the understanding about how the war really works, especially in terms of the public sector, in terms of being part of the policy making circle, understanding human decisions, understanding group thinking, understanding you know, uh, systematic design. But what really connect all these three different concentrations together is our human-centered approach, is our basic you know, foundations, such as courses like uh, you know, economics of growth and development, just to equip our students with the vocabulary to talk about economic issues so that you, when you pick up a copy of the Economist magazine, you understand the issues at hand, you understand how to engage and speak to different audiences. And once you are clear about which concentration you're interested in and what kind of um, topics or themes you would like to really dive deep to, to study, then I can say a few words about the plan for two years. Once you arrive, as I mentioned, the first year, especially the first, very first semester, you are gonna dedicate all your time and energy to lay the foundations for your work, especially by taking those foundational courses. For example, in addition to uh, the core required course that apply to every master student um, in the program, including integral human development, this human-centered approach, ethical thinking, and also economics growth and development, you are gonna also take, for example, foundations of sustainable development class for sustainable development concentration foundations of governance and policy for that concentration and foundations of peace study for the peace study uh, program. And also the other very important, um, I would say um, element I want to add probably in the next slide is your practicum. In the first year for students who are focusing on sustainable development and governance and policy, what well, you will also start taking your classes in the integration lab, what we call iLab we'll say more in the following slide. So by taking all these foundational courses, get yourself ready to really learn, have the solid knowledge about basic theories and concepts and uh, critical thinking, 
analytical skills, and also, of course, oral presentation and writing skills. And then you're going to move on to the summer, during which you will conduct field experience. For peer study students, it will be six months long. I have another slide for that information. And for the other two concentration, you will spend the entire summer in the field, funded, by the way, by our program, which is quite unique, I would say, compared to other uh, peer programs. And after that, you will come back in your second year. Now that you have very uh, solid experience in the field, you really know more what kind of areas you need to add more into your learning, into your understanding, your knowledge, your skills. So that is the second year. You have a lot less core required courses. Rather, you really have the space to add different elective classes of your own interest so that you can build your own curriculum, mini curriculum during this uh, second year, the time of the second year, at the same time, throughout the entire two year period, you will also engage with a uh, required and yet a non credit bearing career colloquium. That is the place that the entire cohort meets, you know, regularly, every um, semester, only six times, actually, students said that probably is not enough, but um, actually it's the place that you talk to each other about your career pursuit, about how to write your resume, about how to conduct, you know, interviews, how to pitch to different, you know, potential future employers, your own ideas about your career, about your policy recommendations, about the ideas of conducting practice in the field. So um, we also have other opportunities during these two years. For example, we have fully funded um, opportunity to go to DC. We have an office in DC for students who are interested in um, politics. Uh, you know, DC is the, is the center of American politics. But I also want you to say that DC is the place that there are lots of um, international organizations and global institutions are located. So that is the place you can also go and uh, polish your own understanding, you know, advance your career there by connecting with different people, by conducting network for your professional development. So by all means, in the Keo School, in your uh, master's program, we do everything to help you to customize your own experience, to tailor, you know, towards your own uh, pursuit, academic interest, but also career pursuit. So you can see that this is just a very short list of topics or themes that um, we offer here. As I mentioned, if you're interested in environmental issues, we have a core required course on environmental policy. And we have um, different faculty members. For example, one works on forestation, one works on water issue, one works on energy, and one works on, um, you know, at the intersection of food security and environmental issues. And we also have another uh, faculty member who is on leave this year working on, um, you know, water issue in uh, Pakistan and especially how, you know, different levels of uh, authorities from top from government, from local, but also from social, uh, civil society, the dynamics and then how that makes, you know, work or doesn't. And if you're interested in, say, um, peace building, conflict resolution. We also have very strong faculty on this topic um, from laying the groundwork for strategic peace building to a variety of skill sets, you know, mediation, but also um, writing skills. And we also have human rights and global religion. Remember that second slide I show you, the very diverse academic home here in the Kiyo School is, you know, it, including nine different institutes and centers. So that means in addition to the classes you're gonna take, conversation you're gonna have with your professors, with your classmates, you also have a very rich, I would say, manual of possibilities and opportunities for you to choose from to engage with different uh, institutes and centers. Many students told me that um, sometimes they walked into one institute and later they learned and were led to many different opportunities related to that particular institute, but also to other institutes who had a collaboration with that institute. So that's how once you have the first step, you will have step two, three, four, forward, and more and more. Just, you know, if you, are, if you have enough time and energy, you actually could explore more here in the Kiel School. 
So just a few words about a uh, few experience. So I want you to emphasize that this is a professional program. In addition to classroom learning, we really emphasize students' hands-on experience in the field. We believe that um, you know, only by connecting theoretical thinking and a real life kind of um, engagement can our students really get a solid understanding of how the world really works and um, really polish and um, uh, polish their own skills. So one I mentioned already that is integration lab. iLab uh, primarily draws you know, sustainable development and governance policy students to conduct field work. And um, it is about three semester long. As I mentioned previously, in the first semester, you will take required courses in iLab, that is iLab um, required courses, for example, you understand the basic of a research method, how to design a project, how to manage, monitor, and evaluate a project, and then also to learn uh, how to work as a team. Usually, we have a team of four to five students working with a global partner. So for example, last year, I was um, talking to a group of students. They were working with one of the um, non uh, governmental organizations, you know, basically trying to promote this uh, product of, um, you know, um, air purifier in India because air quality was just really very bad. And so the question is not just about how to promote, you know, a certain type of product, but also how to really promote the idea of um, air quality, how to, you know, really go beyond the barrier, probably in local culture, local community, this really the sense of, um, you know, looking at some purifier in your room as something alien, as something, you know, uh, not non-trustworthy. So it's not just about, um, not just about, you know, the, the product itself, but also about psychology. It's also about human uh, behavior, human decisions. So students were talking about, you know, their field experience in India, engaging with local, uh, government, but also school teachers, but also parents, and uh, talking about how to provide this kind of service in order to improve air quality, especially for um, school child, for children, so that um, their health can be, you know, guaranteed, that can be protected. So, and uh, for peace study students, you are going to also take, you know, different classes uh, with peace studies, um, internship. The internship is, is longer compared to iLab. iLab basically, you know, you do lots of preparation work in the first two semesters, then you, then you go to the field for about eight to 10 weeks, and then you come back in the third semester, the second fall semester, you take another set of class modules uh, under iLab, you know, you basically uh, reflect on your field experience and you, pro you produce that kind of, you know, either policy recommendation or deliver, uh, deliver, uh, deliveries. And then for P studies internship, actually it's a lot longer. Student will stay in the field for six months. So in the summer, but also the second fall semester and that they will stay very close contact with the P study concentration. They will write their own blog. By the way, we have a student in uh, Keo Insider's blog, you can see that the you know, experiences and reflections that our master students have been writing about their field experience. So they learn, have the firsthand experience about you know, how to really work on the ground. That is exactly what I want you to point you to, the Keo Insider blog. And also, I also want you to uh, say a few words about our faculty. So here are only three faculty members. I don't have enough time and space to list them all on this, you know, during this info session. When you have a moment, please uh, check out our website. We have a faculty website. You can see different faculty members, their research areas, their expertise, and their passion as well. What really drives them? Work so late at night and travel all around the world during summer, during breaks, just to get their research done, just to get a better understanding of different issues and questions. So just, you know, two, uh, three different, three examples. Paul Winters, professor, he's the Keo, uh, he's a chair, endowed chair professor in the Keo School. He's a trained economist with expertise on rural 
uh, poverty. So he was an economist. He was a professor at American University for a decade. And then he went on to UM, uh, served as the vice president of knowledge management and strategic planning um, under the UN, I believe, International Fund for more than five years before um, he returned to the academia and joined the Keogh School. So he has been teaching the core courses for sustainable development, foundations of sustainable development. And he's also our incoming academic affair, uh, associate dean for academic affairs. And he had connected many of our students with different institutions and also organizations for internships or for research assistant opportunities. And you can see that in the middle, our another faculty member, Abby Cordova, herself coming from uh, Latin America. She's a former USAID lead researcher and Latin American politics you know, expert. She is an associate professor. She teaches classes about you know, governance, about crime, about women and politics, and about Latin America. And you also have another faculty member initially coming from Philippines, Diane Dizierto, professor, and she is the legal scholar. She's the expert um, uh, for the United Nations and human rights lawyer. And uh, she has a joint appointment, appointment with the Keogh School, but also law school as well. She also connected many of our master's students with different organizations, including UN and brought some of them as her research assistants to different commission and also meetings as well. So, you know, by saying this, I want you to say that master's program in a Keogh School is a great place for you to launch your global career. By taking different classes, by you know connecting with different faculty members, you will be able to really pursue your careers with a lot more knowledge, stronger skills, but also clearer goals and understandings. Um, I often say to students that um, you know no matter where you go, it's very important to remember three R's, especially in the setting of the Keogh School, Notre Dame in general. You know, the first R is research. We are academic program. It really emphasize um, rigor in research design, research implementation. You need to learn how to conduct research, how to really evaluate your project, manage. Um, that can translate later into your work. And then second one is resource. Resource is about, you know, different ways to navigate the system, to understand how the system works and how to really integrate your own self, your knowledge, your own, your future, your goal into that kind of larger, you know, uh, picture. And the most important part is relationship. We want you to build a professional relationship with you. You are our future partners. You will be the student for two years, but moving on, we will continue to support you, you know, as one of our alumni, future alumni. You can see that, um, uh, we do our best to support our students' career development. As I mentioned, we have career colloquium every semester. We also have different funding to support students' professional pursue. And um, for a professional program, you probably are very interested in our uh, career placement, you know, the outcomes. I can say very proudly that um, we have had very, very good career outcomes in the past so many years. So almost every cohort, I would say the, the average number is about 95%. And last, I think, year of um, uh, class of 2021, it was 100%. Student either find a job or they had uh, further studies into PhD programs. And you can see that our students enter different kinds of sectors. Some of them went to non-governmental um, organizations, and some of them went to public sectors, some of them went to um, you know, private sectors. So um, we've started, we've seen the trend, I would say probably um, about 50% of students went to an NGO and about 20% uh, so far went to public sector, about 17% went to you know, private sector, but also some other students went to further studies about 10 to 15% each cohort, it varies sometimes. And also you know, the rest, some of them are further study, some of them went to foundations and um, multilateral organizations. And uh, there are different kinds of positions they receive. This is just a very short list of um, you know, titles or positions our students receive. So if you have any more questions, feel free to ask them during the Q&A session. And 
the very practical information is about a mission process. The deadline is December 15. So um, if you're interested, don't miss the deadline. We very much look forward to receiving your application, reading your passion, and um, hopefully we'll see you next fall. So a completed in, uh, application includes this long list of you know, different um, materials. I think you can find this information easily on the Keo School admissions website. You can also find the information, I believe on the website of graduate school, especially about um, graduate school application. And um, so you probably are interested about general you know, um, financial aid. When I was a student, I was very interested in that question as well because financial support is very important. So as I mentioned, um, all our students in the program, especially in you know when they conduct field research, both in uh, DPP, meaning the six month long peace study field experience or iLab, they are fully funded by the program. And I would say most of the, I would say all students receive different kinds of funding. Some of them receive a full ride. Some of them receive, you know, mass majority of uh, having their vast majority of tuition covered. So uh, I have to say that um, master's program has been a very generous program in terms of providing support financially for our students. And um, so I know that um, you probably have many questions. Sorry, I wanted to leave some questions, uh, time for your questions, just to bring everything together. I wanted to say that um, some highlights about our program. It is a very much multidisciplinary and uh, human-oriented program through the lens of human dignity. In Kyo School Master's Program, you will gain experience in the field with partners, you know, through the iLab or peace study experience, and you will join a diverse global community, not just the diversity among student population, but also among faculty members and staff members as well. Um, you will have great opportunities to learn from, you know, the really famous, well-known, accomplished faculty members, very compassionate, uh, very, you know, supportive staff members, you will be able to gain the firsthand experience in the field and uh, all this knowledge and um, skills and competency eventually will contribute to the advancement of your own career. So the next step is for you to apply. Apply to our program by December 15th, 2022. If you have any other questions, I would suggest that you look for those information on the Kios website, kios.nd.edu slash apply. You will find lots of information there. If you have any other information yet you could not find answer on our website, please write your question to this email account, kios-admissions uh, at nd.edu. I very much look forward to receiving your questions, to hearing from you, and to reading your applications. Thank you. Okay, now I will stop sharing and let me take a look and see what kind of questions you have. Um, so the very first question is, uh, what is the prescribed font size and line spacing for the personal statement? Um, I, I think, you know, if you do size 12 and you just do, you know, the, the basically typical times or any other font size that you feel comfortable, you can just use it. I don't think we have any specific requirement on that question. Um, so one student asked that I have background in electric, um, electrical engineering. Uh, will I be admitted on scholarship? I think, you know, we actually welcome students coming from all kinds of backgrounds. So you have you you are if you are a trained um, engineer, of course, feel free to apply to our program. And we actually have faculty members who are trained engineer as well. So for example, the director of the iLab Integration Lab, Tracy, um, she actually is a trained uh, engineer. So her research has been focusing on you know combining engineering uh, methods and um, means 
to build that kind of housing in places that has been really damaged by say flood and hurricane, you know, because on one hand, you want to have affordable housing for local community. On the other hand, you also want to have that kind of housing that could stand, that could really um, endure the damage um, of the harm of natural disasters. So Tracy, for example, has been working on this. She's one of the leading experts in the world, in the country as well. Um, the other faculty member, uh, Professor Emily Gruber, who will come, will join us in the fall 2023, is also a trained engineer. And her area of expertise is on energy policy. So she examines, for example, you know, the, the components of the air, and then to examine, you know, how different energy, you know, um, emits different kinds of gases in the air and how to support local community to uh, increase life uh, quality. So when we talk about global issues or uh, contemporary challenges like this, they are never one dimensional. They are always multiple, multi-dimensional, multi-perspective. That's why in the Kyo School, you will be able to learn from many different faculty members and scholars to engage with issue from multiple perspectives and dimensions. Um, so we have question, for example, and um, is the GRE required? No, the GRE is not required, it's optional. So you probably have seen that um, on our website, that is not required, but you, if English is not your native language, you need to provide you know, the standardized exam, for example, TOEFL, just to demonstrate your language capability. Is it possible to get into touch with the students? Yes. Uh, during the admissions process, we actually have you know, student, current student, uh, we call them ambassadors. They reach out to students who have applied or interested in applying to our programs and talk about you know, experience, student life and experience in the program. Definitely, you can get in touch with our current students. Is the concentration we choose at the beginning, um, you know, is there a possibility to change it after taking a few classes? I would say it really depends on where you are in terms of the timing. As I mentioned, the very first semester is the time when you are going to take uh, core required courses. So core required courses, there are two categories. One is the core required courses for the entire cohort that every master's student has to take. And then the other is the other set of core required courses is um, very much concentration specific. So for example, for sustainable development concentration, you're gonna take foundations of sustainable development, you're gonna take applied microeconomics, you're gonna take you know, policy evaluation, some of the courses are in the first, very first master, some of them in the second. So if you have completed all those core required courses, you know, in the first semester already, and you wanted to switch concentration, I would say that will be challenging because then you will have to go back and retake the required courses for the other concentration. So my suggestion is before you apply and, uh, you know, put your kind of name down for a particular concentration, read through our information thoroughly, understand what kind of concentration, you know, especially in terms of uh, competencies and skill sets and career pursuit that you really would like to do. Then you will have a better understanding about, you know, which concentration. And if you really find after you joined us that, oh, this is not something I would like to continue, of course, we can have that kind of conversation. Um, so, you know, a student asked whether you will be allowed to pursue two concentrations uh, simultaneously. I would say it is a great to hear such, you know, ambitious question, you know, always wonderful to hear students would like to do more. Um, but I will say just practical speaking, you probably will find it challenging because only because you only have 24 hours a day, you need some time to sleep and then you have the rest of the time to take your classes and get yourself prepared, you know, get your assignment done. Um, when you take all these classes, and I would say probably you will find it very challenging, stretched very thin. My suggestion is you will have one concentration, but if you have capacity, time, energy, interest, then you can take, you know, another 
classes that tailored to another concentration, you know, as your elective, get that kind of idea. For example, some of our sustainable development students actually are taking classes uh, tailored for peace study students. You probably will think, hey, what is the connection be between the two? It's intriguing, right? Because some sustainable development students find out that um, some of the peace study courses, for example, courses focusing on mediation, conflict resolution, very helpful to have the kind of skill sets to bring people of diverse interest around the table. In the future, imagine in your work, you have different colleagues who have different opinions about a project. How to speak to different, you know, your colleagues of different opinions and how to convince them, how to find a common ground to work together. So those kind of human skills are not just limited to, you know, peace studies. Actually, you could use that in our everyday life, wherever you are, whatever, you know, industry you are. So that's why I would say, yes, you can definitely take classes as many as you wish, um, as many as you can, but I don't think it's practically, you know, feasible to do two concentrations simultaneously. Um, if someone, another question that just came in, if someone just completed a bachelor degree without formal job um, work experience, can the person apply? Do I need to have experience prior to applying to the program? It's a great question. I would say that, um, you know, it depends on what kind of experience you have. So for example, during your four years of college life, some of the students just now saying, you know, undergraduate students on Notre Dame campus, some of them started to do internships as early as their very first summer, or even during their regular semesters, they find time to volunteer, they find time to engage with different communities. So I would say, if you think that um, you have sufficient experience that you could speak to you know, our program, especially making connection with our program, your learning, and also your experience, and most importantly, your own career pursuit, then yes, why not try? There's no guarantee, but um, I would say you can, you can give it a try because you know, this is a professional program. The expectation is that um, students coming into the program need to already have some understanding of how you know, the real world actually functions, not just limited in the classroom setting. And then that actually would really make their learning in the program more effective because of this prior knowledge. Therefore, they know what really need for them to continue their career development and their learning will be more you know, tailored or targeted. So, but if you think that um, your experience during four years of bachelor degree also give you that kind of insight, yes, I would say, um, you certainly can apply. So another question that just came in, for those who have yet to gain two plus years of international experience, what advice would you share regarding the application? Um, I would say your essay, you know, I believe there are two essays. One is a very short, probably only 300 words, that kind of um, application um, statement of intent, primarily on the concentration of your uh, choice. And then the other is a lot longer uh, statement, you know, statement of purpose, something like that we require too. So my suggestion is that um, the most important part is how you weave your uh, professional experience into your pursuit of this master's program. You know, for our review process, admissions review process, we are looking at the you know merit of your application, everybody's application, merit that includes academic qualification, because this is an academic program um, that emphasize rigor. Of course, we want our student to be succeed, be able to succeed in the program. So when we recruit our students, we are looking at their, for example, transcript and their past uh, academic achievements. But equally important, we're looking at our students' professional development and what kind of experience they bring into the program and how the program could really help the student to continue further develop their own professional development. You know, so this is also mutual. It's not just about what um, 
the program can give you, but also how, what kind of enriching experience you can share with your classmates and into the program as well. Um, so another, I hope this is helpful. And uh, another question is, what is the added value of a six month field experience for those who already have at least two years of experience in the field? It's a great question. So I would say, you know, I don't know what kind of, you know, um, at least two years of experience you have. I would say the six month long field experience um, with the P study concentration is very much structured structure in the sense that um, before you go, you will take, you know, core required courses in terms of how to conduct a few experience. You will also stay in close contact with your concentration directors and also, you know, the program uh, staff and faculty members, faculty advisors in particular. And, uh, you know, it is not just about being in the field, but also very intentional but also uh, very purposeful. You know what you will do. And in that process, you will also integrate what you have learned in the first year into your field experience. And also write about that. As remember, I mentioned insider's blog during that process. And when you come back, you also integrate that kind of experience into your peace study capstone project in the end. Every year we have peace study students presenting on their project. In their project presentation capstone, they often talk about their field experience. So it's not just about, it is about day-to-day -day operation in the field with local community, with your project managers, with the organizations, but more importantly is about how this experience connects with your you know, classroom learning, connects with the theories and uh, skills and you know, competencies that you acquire in the classroom setting. And also how that kind of experience would basically you know, clarify your own career path for you in the future. So I personally think that is very valuable. And of course, very more importantly is also, you know, a manifestation of this accompaniment um, notion. It is not just about dropping somebody on the local ground for two weeks, you know, take a look, talk to a few people and say, you know what, I know what to do. Here is my policy recommendation. That is not the approach that Kyo School takes. We believe that in order to make uh, substantive, meaningful changes, it's very important for our students who will be future change makers and global leaders to understand local circumstances, traditions, cultures, gender dynamics, all those, in order to make that kind of meaningful, effective changes. Um, who is eligible for scholarship? A full tuition scholarship for available for all concentrations? How do you apply for scholarships? Okay, so as I mentioned during you know, the presentation, we provide really generous um, funding support for our students. Um, I would say, you can probably imagine, you know, we don't, okay, I would say all students receive financial support, but the degree varies. The top tier students, most competitive, they will receive a full ride. Full ride meaning, that covers uh, tuition, but also provides monthly stipend, period. It's great. Um, and then we also have students based on their qualification, their application, also, you know, different circumstances they indicated in their application materials. We also have students who receive full tuition scholarship and probably, you know, uh, uh, half of the stipend or some of them with, um, you know, only a portion of stipend, but um, in terms of the field experience, if you look around in different peer programs, you know, we cover, we provide full support for field experience, both in ILAP and um, peace study as well. So how do you apply for scholarships? I would say in your application, I was, uh, you just try to polish your application as well as you can about you know, the articulation of your ideas, you know, your passion you, for your career, for, for future, but also why you think that um, you are great for us to take you, but also to give you a full ride. So you know, it's, a, it's a holistic approach for us. We don't just look at one item in your application, we look at all of them. And every year we have 
always had heated debates among you know members of um, review committee because we look at different perspectives of the future you know the candidates and um, sometimes we also conduct interviews because we want you to have a better understanding about you about you know your um, ideas of the program and also your future development so this is the mutual process you know you choose us and we choose you and that's how as I mentioned um, you know it's a very re important uh, valuable relationship that we see as a program because we always believe that um, you know on one on the one hand students yes we as a program shape students by training them by offering different kinds of classes and um, different kinds of support opportunities but on the other hand students also shape our program as well you know their needs their desire to learn different skills and their knowledge and understanding of the field that um, they have been working on also brings new insight to our program and um, to the classmates, faculty, the school as well. So it's really, I would say, very exciting time every year this time for us to know that um, students are interested in our program and we are gonna receive you know, another round of applications to the program. Okay, another question is, can you say more about the office you have in DC? When and how do we take advantage of that? So we have a DC office. We have, you know, um, faculty members there. We also have staff members there. And um, that is the place, I would say, that brings master program to DC, but also brings DC to the Keogh School, which is in the Midwest. Um, how to understand that uh, two-way traffic, I would say. On the one hand, DC office is able to, you know, um, connect with all kinds of policymakers, organizations, practitioners, and invite them to give uh, public lectures or speeches or, you know, um, talks or meeting with our students. And I would say most of the time, whenever these kinds of, you know, um, visitors, guests came to our campus, we always arrange meetings with four MGA students master students to meet with them, to talk about their own projects, their own prof professional development. Um, but that is only one way. On the other is that um, students are also are strongly encouraged to connect with the DC office. I would say one most, um, you know, I would say clear, obvious example is this um, DC immersive DC trip that we have in the program every um, spring semester. This year we have two, one in the fall semester and the other in the coming spring semester because we have a, a off cycle, a group of off cycle master students whose visa was delayed because of pandemic. So that's why we, you know, we get the funding to just to, for that group of students. But regularly we have at least one, you know, trip. That class, that's a credit bearing class, by the way, you know, to take the class, student will, you know go through the syllabus in terms of the readings, materials to understand, you know, institutions, understand, um, you know, policy making, um, and also understand different skills in terms of how to pitch their own experience and projects um, to certain bureaus or departments or certain figures in different departments and bureaus. And then during the uh, spring break, usually, uh, students will travel as a group, entire class with the faculty member to DC. They will have, you know, for the entire week, they have group meetings with different um, bureaus and different, you know, units, um, either at the Hill or different, you know, uh, offices or with um, international organizations. Or students can set up individual meetings with people with the assistance of the DC office. So, um, I would say, you know, that's the in terms of the class setting, in the class setting, but you are also make your individual trip to DC as well. And you can make that kind of connection with the with our colleagues in DC office. There are many different ways you can take advantage of that. And we also, by the way, remember I mentioned that Keogh School has nine institutes and centers. We also have institutes and centers that offer opportunities, yes, to DC as well. For example, Nanavik Institute has a program student facing on diplomacy. So they connect with European um, you know, Academy of uh, Diplomats. They talk about how to really train our students um, 
into the crafts of diplomacy, you know, foreign services. They also, this actually this past week was the fall break on campus. And they also took a group of master's students to DC as well through that class. And um, of course the NANAMIC, you know, is a European studies institute. And also it has trips to Europe, to Brussels and to different, um, you know, European cities and having internships, research assistantships, I would say there are vast amounts of opportunities. It really depends on you, your time, your willingness, and your effort to explore and to get hold of this. So there are many different ways to take advantage of this. Okay, um, can, can I get a um, an application fee waiver? I believe so. I think you know um, there there are some instructions on our website for you to get that application fee waiver. I think I have um, gone through most of the questions, and um, we apologize that we did not get to answer all of your questions. But all these questions are great, and um, I just want you to you know, draw, you know, your attention to remember the last slide that I showed you during my presentation. Remember, our school website, keo.nd.edu slash apply. That website has lots of information for you to know how to apply to our master's program. And remember, our deadline is December 15th. December 15th, before the new year. So you need to get your materials later, uh, ready. So now we are about, I would say um, six weeks, no, actually more than six weeks. We're about uh, seven, seven to eight weeks away, seven weeks away from that deadline. So um, don't, don't wait until the last minute. I understand how stressful it is. And trust me, it will take you a few days to put the application together. You will need some time to put your personal information into the application, but most importantly, you need to take some time to write your essay, your statement, your intent. That is the most important, most important part of your application. Yes, we're going to look at your transcript, we'll look at your recommendation letters, we're going to look at your exam scores, but we also want to know who you are, why you are so interested, why we want you to be here and why we are so important to you, right? So how you write about yourself, how you craft that statement is very important. That is the one way that you communicate with us who you are. So give yourself some time, several weekends together to put your materials together and submit it by December 15th. If you have any other questions that we didn't get to answer due to the time limit today, don't worry, we're gonna have another info session, I believe, and you also can send an email with your questions to that email account, keo-admissions at nd.edu. Okay, so um, I think we are almost at one hour. Um, I will just stop here. Thank you very much for taking your time to join me today. Although I couldn't see you, um, I know that you are listening and I really hope that uh, information I provided here is useful and helpful for you to better understand our program. And I want you to also thank my colleagues um, who are in the back end that you can see and I can see, but they shared all those questions you've sent in with me that allows me to have the time to address every good, great question you have just asked. And that is how we work in the Keo School, in the master's program. We work as a team, we stay together. Okay, take care. And um, again, our deadline is December 15, 2022. Stay in touch and good luck with your application.